as this is our inaugural, our very first webinar in our series of uh, research meets management, Professor Deepak Jain, President of Europe for SEEPS, he's with us on the call. I'd like to give him an opportunity to give us a short welcome. Deepak, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert. And as my colleague Robert just mentioned, we are starting this series, what I would say to bring the best of minds of CIBS to the management field. Today, the inaugural session would be with Professor Jutian, who would be introduced later. But let me tell you what I think the purpose behind this webinar is. As a business institution or as an academic institution, we have a threefold mission, what I call knowledge creation through research, knowledge dissemination through our sharing of knowledge that we create. And third is knowledge certification because we academic institutions can certify this person got an MBA degree, this person got an executive MBA and so on. Knowledge creation and knowledge dissemination are the two core functions of any university. And I consider them as the two sides of the same coin. Seeds research meets management. Research is the knowledge creation and meeting with management is the dissemination part. And today, the reason I'm very excited about the today's seminar is my colleague, Professor Jutian has written an exceptional piece on what I would describe as what is China's competitive advantage. And this is not for China, but for the world to understand what China is about and how China has reached to this level of excellence by its efforts, by the efforts of the people and by all the right economic, social, and cultural policies. And my final comment, always I encourage faculty member to share the research because physically we cannot travel all over the world, but our research, our books can go to any place in the world where human beings may not be able to go physically. So this is writing books, reports, research articles, is one way for us to reach out to the world and work on educating people about who we are, what we do at CIBS. And Robert, thank you for taking this initiative. This is going to be a great webinar series for 2022. And as SIBS European president, I'm very delighted to be a part of this. And really you would enjoy the rest of the session today in terms of understanding China. People, call, when I was the Dean of INSEAD, people used to say INSEAD business school for the world. SEEPS is business school for the world that is interested in China, Chinese corporations and Chinese consumer behavior. Thank you all. Robert, the floor is back to you. Thank you so much. We appreciate your, your sponsorship for this initiative. Thank you for your kind words. Professor Xu is a professor of economics, Santander chair in economics, He's the Associate Dean and Director of our EMBA program at SEEPS. He's flat out a rock star at SEEPS. He's a great researcher, he's a kind man, and he's an amazing teacher. His multi-year research on how China has grown and how it's grown faster than any other economy is accumulated in his book, Catching Up with America. Go read it, buy the book, you will learn so much. I won't waste any more of his precious time. I now present to you, Professor Xu. Professor, please. Thank you, Robert, uh, for your nice introduction. Thank you to Deepak for getting up so early in America to, 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 to join this, uh, this uh, uh, webinar series. So it's really a great honor for me to, to, to be the first speaker of this uh, new SEEPS uh, research meets management webinar series. I think that's a, this is a great initiative and it's a great honor for me to, to, do, to be the first speaker. And also, I, 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 thanks to, to the, to the uh, participants, I saw some familiar names. Thank you for joining us today. So I'm going to talk, talk about the, the rise of China 
so uh, so my topic, of course, is the rise of China. And uh, what do I mean by that? It, in a very narrow sense, basically, I look at the economic rise of China. If you look at this uh, graph, uh, you can see that the, uh, the, the GDP of China has gone from a very low level in 1978, when China began its economic reform, to, to being the second largest economy in the world. So, uh, so China actually wasn't even in the top 10. Uh, I think China was uh, number 11 behind uh, the Netherlands uh, back in 1978. Now, of course, it's the second largest economy. So, so the question, of course, is what has driven the rise of China? And uh, can China's further rise be slowed or even reversed by the current uh, poor US-China relations? Uh, and uh, can China catch up to America economically and technologically, or if yes, when? Or in other words, what is China's long-term economic prospect? So these are the questions I try to address in my new book uh, published by Cambridge University Press uh, two months ago, uh, Catch Up to China, Culture, Institutions, and the Rise of China. So of course, uh, China has grown very fast over the past four decades. Uh, compared to the US, it's very clear. So uh, 40 years ago, uh, so the US had a GDP that was 20 times as large as China's GDP. Uh, today, of course, China's GDP uh, is uh, two thirds of the US uh, GDP level. Uh, so of course, China growing faster than the US is not surprising to us uh, because China started from a very low base. By that, uh, we mean the per capita GDP level. So in this graph, we can see that uh, 40 years ago, China had a per capita GDP measured by the 2010 constant US dollars. China started at 300 US dollars per person. And the US started at about 30,000 US dollars per person. So that's, so in a sense, China's per capita GDP or per capita income uh, was only 1% of the US level. And then after 14, uh, 40 years of rapid growth, China's uh, current per capita GDP uh, has reached about 15 to 16% of the US level. Now, so the annual growth rate uh, of per capita GDP uh, for the US has been 1.66% a year. And for China, it has been 8.4% a year. So of course, it's not, not surprising China started at a very low level. Even today, China's per capita GDP is still one sixth of the US level. Now, uh, then of course, it's not surprising that China also has grown faster than Europe and it has grown faster than Japan. And uh, you can see that if you take a long-term perspective so almost all developed countries grow at about the same rate uh, uh, over the past 40 years. It's been really 1.67 or 1.65 around that figure. And uh, so India has also grown very fast over the past 40 years. And so has been Korea. Now, but if you are an Indian citizen, of course, when you look at this graph, you don't, you are, you are not going to feel very happy about uh, India's fast growth because, of course, India has grown faster than the U.S. and Europe and Japan. But compared to China, India, Indians, Indian growth has been too slow. Only half of the Chinese level uh, over the past forty years. Now, so this, of course, uh, I think uh, uh, is uh, somewhat a misconception in the sense that it's based on the assumption that uh, low income basis will make it uh, low income countries should grow faster than uh, than the high income countries but the fact is not it's not the, that's not the truth if you look at africa sub saharan africa over the past 40 years so their annual compound growth rate has been basically close to 0.2% a year so you can see that uh, 40 years ago uh, africa as a whole was much richer than china china and then China and India. 
So uh, now, of course, China is much richer than Africa. So, so we might say that after 40 years of rapid growth, China has gone from being the poorest country in the world to being the richest poor country in the world. So China, of course, was the poorest in the whole world 40 years ago. Now it's, it's still a poor country in the sense that China is still much poorer than uh, uh, rich uh, European countries, than America, than Japan. Uh, but China, of course, is rich compared to Africa and India. So uh, China, of course, is not that poor. Uh, it is, it is, it is, of course, relatively rich uh, along the coastal areas, but then uh, there are a lot of poor Chinese people in the inland provinces and in the rural area. So, so if you look at, so you look at this, so China, of course, has done well compared to not only to, to, to India and Korea, but also compared to, to, to uh, Africa. Now let's look at uh, some, so Africa, uh, at, normally we view African, many of the African countries are low income countries by the World Bank's uh, classification. Now, uh, we look at the Middle East and the North African countries, uh, Arab countries. So they started at a much higher level than China, uh, more than $3,000 uh, per, per person 40 years ago. But today it's still barely above $4,000 a year. So the average growth rate over the past 40 years has been less than 1%. And then you look at uh, Latin America and the Caribbean countries, so again, so they started at $6,000 per person 40 years ago to today's $9,000 per person. So you, you, again, you see uh, a growth that is lower than 1%. So you, when you, you look at this uh, graph, you can see that more developing countries have grown more slowly than the developed countries. So that is Mexico and the, Mexico and Argentina have grown more slowly than America. So in that sense, so growing low income doesn't make a country grow fast. So if you actually look at this graph, uh, this is what I call the global comparative perspective. Then you can see that uh, India has been a star performer. So India growing uh, more slowly than China is not a puzzle to me. So the puzzle to me is, how come China has been the fastest growing economy in the world? So another puzzle actually for India economists would be this. How come after China, India has been the second fastest growing economy in the world compared to other developing countries? So in, the sense, so in that sense, so we have to answer this question. So what has really driven the fast growth of China and Korea and India. So the answers to, 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 uh, to these questions should be uh, uh, very similar. So of course, uh, when we look at China, so the, the, the most uh, common explanation for China's fast rise is reform and opening up. But then of course, this can only explain why China has been growing faster than let's say Indonesia. Uh, no, uh, that, 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 no, this has been, well, reform and opening up has been able to explain why China has been growing faster after economic reform than before economic reform in 1978. And it can also explain why China has grown faster than North Korea and Cuba, and that's it. So it can not help us to understand why China has been able to grow much faster than the Philippines or than Indonesia or than in Nigeria or in than any other countries. So in fact, if you look at uh, uh, the, uh, this rank the table rankings from two think tanks on um, the degree of economic freedom. China actually ranks quite uh, low in this table, and China is below average uh, in terms of economic freedom. And uh, India also doesn't rank highly. India is also basically India in general is ranked uh, below China. So, so if you look at this, so it's not that so China has China's Fast growth, of course, uh, cannot. Uh, of course, is attributed should be attributed to, to to economic reform and opening up. But that's only a precondition for China's takeoff, because almost all 
economists in the world, or most of the economists in the world have been marketized, but the few economists have grown very fast. So, so in a sense, uh, mark, reform and open up may be viewed as a necessary condition, but not the advantage of China's economy. So uh, then, of course, then people naturally will come to the uh, to the uh, answer of this uh, of, of China having a strong government. But then, uh, so so why what, what makes uh, China's government particularly strong? Some people say it's the political regime. Now, if you actually look at the political regime, uh, some researchers have, have done this so-called the democracy index. Uh, they, they, they really look at the, uh, the relationship between uh, political regime, whether it's a democracy or autocracy, and the relationship of this with economic growth. Now, in this graph, a stack, uh, it's called a scatter plot. So every dot represents a country. And... Uh, uh, China is uh, at uh, is right there. That's China, and uh, the, all all countries here represented are, are developing countries because rich countries are all very similar. Uh, rich countries uh, are mostly democratic and have a perfect democracy index, and then their growth rate has been very similar around one to two percent a year. Now, if you look at this graph, you don't see any relationship between economic growth rate and the uh, democracy index. Of course, uh, China by this, because this is done by, uh, by Western scholars. So China had, had a minus seven uh, democracy index, uh, which means that China is not democratic, but I put a post there, quotation there, because China views itself as being democratic, only that, that the Western, Western scholars can understand China's democracy, whatever that means. Okay, so, so you don't see uh, a really uh, a relationship between political regime and the economic growth. Of course, then you might say, well, maybe it's not the political regime, maybe it's the political stability or government effectiveness. China may do well in these areas. But then, of course, the World Bank has thought about this. So they actually uh, started to assemble data on this. Uh, so they, they tried to get some indicators on political stability or government effectiveness starting in 1996. So basically, I look at the uh, I, I look at the, the data from 1996 to 2016. I get 20 years of their data, and I took an average, and then rank all the economists by their uh, uh, indicators. So surprisingly, China ranked only 151 in in terms of political stability. And uh, but then, of course, it's, there's no mistake there. It doesn't mean that China is not politically stable. Of course, China is very stable. But this indicator simply means that most countries during those 20 years were politically stable. North Korea was even more stable than China, which of course is, shouldn't be very surprising. So, so, uh, so China, of course, is stable, but this, that's, not China's that's not China's advantage. And uh, of course, China's advantage is in terms of government effectiveness. But then China only ranks at 92. It doesn't make, so 92 doesn't make you grow the fastest in the whole world. So, so in that sense, China doesn't seem to have a unique advantage in the government sector. Then, of course, some some people would say, uh, especially Western scholars, with, uh, Western uh, uh, commentators or politicians would say that China had this uh, industry policy or subsidies to S SOEs. But then, actually, if you look at the profitability of, of all the industrial firms, so SOEs are more inefficient than the non-SOEs. So whether in terms of return on assets or return on, on equity. So basically you are subsidizing uh, inefficient companies. Of course, that cannot make your economy more efficient. So in that sense, it cannot be the reason why China has grown faster than, 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 than other countries. Otherwise, so the, the, uh, the, uh, the policy for economic development, development would be much easier, just subsidize companies. That's, uh, of course, you cannot just uh, uh, have an economic takeoff by, by subsidies. Then, of course, uh, it's, it's, it's known that China has been a, a, a powerhouse, a power housing, uh, in, uh, powerhouse in, in, export, in exporting uh, industrial products. So China has been able to take advantage of the globalization uh, movement in the past four decades. But then if you actually look at the data, China has been quite average in the sense that uh, uh, in terms of the measure 
measurement of openness, uh, we use exports as a percentage of GDP to measure a country's uh, openness to the world economy and also to, to measure the reliance of exports. Uh, on, uh, that the, the, uh, how, how much you depend on, on exports. So you can see that uh, uh, the world average is actually uh, is higher than China. Of course, that there, there was there was a few years when China had a very high exports to GDP ratio. But now in most other years, so China's exports to GDP ratio has been very average. It's, it's lower than the world average. And then you, if you look at uh, other countries like India, also started at a very low level uh, with a low uh, export to GDP ratio. Now it's very similar to China. And then you look at Turkey, another big economy also started at very low level, 5%. Now it's, reached, it's, it's about 25%. Then you look at the more open economy like the Mexican economy. Mexico started at 10% 10, 40 years ago. Now it's reaching 40%. So in that sense, all of these large economies in a sense have benefited from globalization, but none of these economies has grown very uh, as fast as China's economy. So in that sense, so China in this sense is not really uh, unique or, or special. China in a sense uh, is, is just quite average. Just think about it, about it. Globalization by definition is global, is a global phenomenon. So all countries can participate in globalization. So China is no exception. So in that sense, so obviously globalization has helped China, but then it has helped, should have helped other countries as well. So China is not unique in this regard. And again, you look at uh, uh, another uh, factor like, like FDI. So FDI, of course, uh, in terms of absolute amount, China has attracted a lot of FDI, but China is a big economy. So if you look at the, F, the ratio of FDI to GDP during the, uh, the 30 year period of 1982 to 2012, when China had the fastest, the fastest growth rates, China's, uh, so that ratio was 3% for China, uh, ranking China at 70, 70th place in the whole world. So there are countries that have, that have attracted more FDI relative to GDP than China during 69 countries that have, that have done better than China. But then of course, you don't see a clear correlation between FDI to GDP ratio and economic growth. Now, uh, of course, then China has been accused of theft of intellectual property rights. Of course, to be sure, China obviously is not a model for protection of intellectual property rights. Uh, but then uh, compared to other developing countries, China doesn't, does not necessarily have a weaker protection of intellectual property rights. If you look at the, if you look, actually look at the data, so between in the past, over the past 20 years, so China's IP payments to foreign companies have increased by 20 some percent a year. So now China uh, uh, is paying 30, 34 billion US dollars a year in IP payments to foreigners, which ranks China on the second uh, after the US. And uh, of, of course it's much more than Latin America combined and much more than uh, India. So. As I said, China, of course, is not uh, may not be great uh, in IP protection, but then it doesn't mean that uh, uh, that's the reason why China has grown faster than other countries. If that's the reason, then 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 then, then development should be much easier. Just let uh, all developing countries use Western countries' IP uh, rights, and then everything will be just fine. So you don't need uh, uh, government aid or any 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 government assistance. So that certainly is not the case. Now, of course, China has a lot of people, uh, abundant cheap labor, and uh, that's sometimes called, uh, people call it demographic dividend. That's actually not what demographic dividend uh, uh, means. Um, so uh, now China does have, uh, have a lot of people, but then uh, in this uh, graph, you can see that there's really no relationship between uh, the size of a country's population and economic growth. That's why we normally use per capita GDP growth as a measure of long-term economic growth. So, uh, so the, then the, the puzzle, of course, then we have a puzzle, which I call the Chinese growth puzzle. The puzzle is not why China has been able to grow uh, so much faster than, uh, than America or than Europe or than Japan. But the, the real puzzle 
is to explain why China has been able to grow so much faster than other developing countries. So what has really driven the rapid rise of China? So of course, I, uh, in my book, uh, I have to use some simple macroeconomics. So the key, of course, is really to distinguish between economic growth and economic fluctuation. So economic growth in, in, in economics is normally defined as a sustained rise in the capacity to supply economic goods and services. So by definition, it's a long-term concept. But economic fluctuation just means the short-term variation in the growth rates of GDP of a country. So these two things are quite uh, are, are different. So when you look at the long-term growth, when we talk about uh, China's rise uh, over the past 40 years, we are really talking about long-term growth. So there are three drivers in economic theory. There are three drivers in economic growth. That's investment, accumulation of physical capital, education, accumulation of human capital, and technological progress. That's accumulation of technologies. So the, 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 the commonly uh, uh, talked about drivers for economic growth like consumption, investment, uh, and exports, these are actually the three causes for economic fluctuation. They don't really drive a country's long-term growth. So, then, so if we look at the, the three drivers of economic growth, investment, education, and technological, growth, technological progress, then we can see that China indeed has done very well in these uh, uh, three areas. So in terms of investment rate, investment as a percent, percent of GDP, China had the highest investment rate uh, more than 39% of GDP over the past 40 years, uh, higher than Korea and Singapore, which were also very high. Then, then, uh, then the question, of course, then if, you, if, if, if growth is, if the investment is so important, why other countries don't just follow China to have more investment? But investment needs money. So the money either comes from growth, growth saving, domestic savings, or from foreign countries. So China uh, happened to have uh, one of the highest savings rates in the whole world. And the China actually has more savings than, than it needs. So China has net exports. So, the, uh, so how come China has so much savings? Because China has a relatively low consumption rate. So, so higher savings, uh, relatively low consumption leads to higher savings, which leads to high domestic investment, which leads to higher growth in China. So that's the first driver of economic growth. That's the first advantage of the, the, the first advantage of the Chinese economy. So the second strength of the Chinese economy is education. Uh, when we talk about education, it's not really the quantitative education. If you look at the, some indicators of quantitative education, like uh, public expenditure on education as a percent of GDP or average years of schooling, China is not special. China is very average. But then economists have found that the quantitative education is not really so important for economic development. It's actually the quality of the quality of education. So some researchers have done uh, have, have done the global uh, studies on, on, on the quality of education. And uh, uh, we can see that this cognitive skills index is done by um, uh, a, a, a famous education economist at Stanford University in the US and his students. So, uh, so they compile this cognitive skills index to represent a country's education quality. You can see that all, almost all the East Asian economies have, have done well in this regard. China is one of the uh, uh, few, one of the two developing countries that have, uh, have a very high level of education quality compared to, to other developing countries. So, so this of course is come, comes from the text uh, from some uh, uh, test scores, uh, common test scores. So uh, they are high, they are completely uh, correlated with high test uh, global international test scores. So so and uh, then they uh, so Hanushek and his students has actually shown that uh, after controlling for uh, the quantitative education and uh, after controlling for income level, they find that uh, this education quality, basic education quality. Uh, is the best predictor of economic growth. So for every one point difference in their cognitive skills index, uh, there is a, so, so one point difference would lead to two percentage points of difference in growth rate. For example, China's uh, score of, uh, uh, of education quality is like five and uh, the score for South Africa or, and Peru are three. So that means 
for on this factor alone, uh, China can potentially grow four percentage points faster than South Africa and uh, Peru. So this is the, in a sense, so, so, so that's why the authors claim that this is the most important factor for economic growth. So now, so that's education. So what about technological progress? So typically, of course, people thought that China is just imitated, which of course is true. So for developing country to make fast technological progress, of course, you have to imitate and copy existing technologies, absorbing existing technologies. But that imitation doesn't mean that you have no innovation. So when you, the more you imitate, the more you, you are going to innovate on your own. So if you, if only if we use the innovate the, the patents, patent applications as a, as an indicator of innovation, you can see that China has uh, gone from being a very ordinary uh, developing country 30 years ago to being the already the the, the the country that has the largest number of patent applications. And then if you look at the scientific articles in international journals, China again jumped from being a very ordinary developing country 20 years ago to being to, to having the largest number of scientific publications in the whole world, even more than European Union combined. And then of course, this is all, uh, all due to the, the fact that China has invested heavily uh, in research and development. China started at a, at a, a relatively low level 0.5% of GDP in R&D expenditure. Now it's reaching uh, the European Union level. So it's, it's already uh, China in, in this regard is more like France than, 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 than Mexico. So, so this of course uh, is also uh, because this, uh, you see the rapid increase in R&D expenditure to GDP ratio in China. But then because GDP growth in China has been the fastest in the world over the past 20 years, so that China's R&D expenditure has been increasing at double digit rate. So, so that of course has contributed to China's uh, fast technological progress. So to summarize, so China's rapid rise in the past four decades has been contributed to by, contributed by a faster accumulation of physical capital due to higher savings than all other developing countries and a relatively higher quality of education, basic education that has made China more capable in absorbing existing Western technologies and developing indigenous innovation capacity leading to faster technological catch up. So for these reasons, I concluded in my book that China's comparative strength is more cultural than institutional or tactical. So in a sense, so China's comparative strengths or China's, the, the differentiating factor behind China's rapid growth is the strong cultural emphasis on savings and education. So that is what that distinguishes China from other developing countries. Now, can China's rise be slowed by the uh, strength U.S.-China relations. So my uh, uh, can, my uh, 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 hypothesis that, is that it's not going to have a significant impact on China's economic growth. So first of all, the U.S. and U.S.-China cannot really be decoupled. So U.S. and China are the, the two economies are highly interdependent on each other. So the U.S. Ex U.S. goods imports from China accounted for 20%, basically one fifth of the US total imports and China's exports of goods accounted for 20% of China's exports to the world. So in a sense, US is, uh, China is the, US, the, the biggest supplier of the US economy and the US economy is, uh, and also uh, is the biggest customer for China. So the two countries are, are totally dependent on each other. So there's no way for, for the two countries to completely decouple. And then if the, if the trade war stops at the tariff, uh, at, the, at, the, at the tariff war, then it's not going to have a significant impact because the total Chinese exports to the US uh, only accounts for like 3% of China's GDP. So even a 25% tariff rate on all Chinese exports would only make 
0.75% of China's GDP. And normally the tariffs, tar the burden of tariffs is, is shared by imports and exports, uh, importers and exporters. So China's burden would be only three, like 0.3 to 0.4% of China's GDP. So it's not going to have a big dent on the Chinese economy. So in that sense, so uh, so if if if, a, if the trade war is, uh, stops at the tariff war, so it's not going to have a huge impact either on the U.S. or on China. So so in that sense, uh, so I, I I think that China's economy may be slowed a bit by some conceivable uh, adverse factors uh, in the future. But unless China significantly reverses its market reforms, then its further rise seems irreversible. Uh, so in other words, so only the Chinese government can slow down Chinese economy. So no foreign governments can do so. So, so now, even if China's further growth is ir irreversible, China will never be so powerful as to dominate the world and no country will. Uh, basically, uh, if you look at the, if we, 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 we forecast China's future growth uh, in the next 30 years. So even if China grows at 6% a year over the next 10 years, so China will become the largest economy in the world in 2030, exactly in 2030. So basically 10 years from now. But even then, China's per capita GDP will still be about 20 five percent of the u.s level now if china's growth if china grows at five percent a year in the next 30 years and the u.s continues to grow as at two percent as they they have they have, they, have, they have done over the past 30 40 years so china will the chinese economy of course would be bigger than the u.s would be 1.6 percent of the u.s level but even then china's capital gdp will be still be at 50%, less than 50% of the US level, which of course, indi which would indicate that China will still be uh, technologically behind the US even 30 years from now. So of course, in terms of aggregate economic power, China will be much bigger, but then if the US, Europe combine together, then of course, uh, the Western economy as a whole will continue to be much bigger than the Chinese economy. And then you, if you, then you include India, which is a democracy, uh, which is also going to grow very fast over the next 30 years. So India will be a power to reckon with. So, so in that sense, so the future uh, the, will be a, a truly multipolar world. So no country will be able to dominate the world. So in that sense, so it, it will be more productive for other countries to try to benefit from the rise of China and also India not to prevent it, which is basically almost impossible. But on the other hand, China also needs to do its part to make the rise of China benefit more than hurt the interest of the rest of the world. So if that's the case, then both China and the rest of the world can hopefully have a win-win situation. So if, if that can hold, then I would say to quote by our European president Deepak, uh, who introduced me uh, earlier, uh, so the best days of China, Chinese economy, and the world economy are still ahead of us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Professor, thank you so much. You have, you, you make a very, very challenging puzzle look easy. I, I know this is years of it, years of research from you. I've seen some of your videos from seven years ago. You know, this is this is not overnight. Uh, you know, back of the envelope hypothesizing. This is, uh, in a way, the accumulation of your your life's work of research um, <laughs> that, that goes into this. And, and uh, uh, you're very Swiss with your understatement uh, about the the, uh, the the success of China's economy. Thank you very much for your insights. With more, we have more than 1,300 people joining joining us today on this webinar. It's uh, it's a real record for us. We have dozens and dozens of questions. We will not ne never be able to get to all of them. We're going to track some of them. Um, mm -hmm. a, a lot of the questions I see coming in um, are of a political nature. We're not going there. The geopolitical tensions are there. Our job is is to focusing on the beat on the on 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 the business side of things.
not on the political side of things. We're trying to build bridges between countries and people and cultures, uh, education and and, and culture being the answer that you've come up with is, is quite fascinating. The first question I'd like to ask you is, can, can we copy, can we emulate this model for, for say Sub-Saharan Africa? That's been asked in a few of the questions or for India, can this model be emulated? That's a great question. Actually, I, I, I come up with, uh, uh, so basically I come across that question from the audience very often. So. So basically, so if my conclusion is correct, so it's not some particular institutional uh, design or, or uh, smart policies that have contributed to China's growth. Uh, I, I, because I didn't have time to, to get into it in the, in, the, in, the, in the lecture, but in my book, I compare China with also with other East Asian economies. So, mm -hmm. so this culture of savings and education it's not unique to China. It's also shared by other economies like Japan and the, the Asian tiger economies, which were influenced significantly by the Confucian culture. Mm -hmm. so, so they also all took off. So all these East Asian uh, economies uh, had a fantastic economic rapid growth and they're catching up very quickly uh, to the developed economies. So, so all these economies had uh, in a sense uh, diverse, uh, diverse, uh, 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 a diversity of, of political uh, regimes and the economic models, but they all took off. So in that sense, so so it's not so that's why I, I so I reached this conclusion. It's, it's probably more cultural than the institutional. So of course, as I said, institutions of course are crucial because without economic reform, Chinese growth miracle wouldn't have been possible. Hmm. And uh, then, then if that's if it's cultural, if it's the emphasis on savings and education, then it's not something that you can imitate very easily. So you really have to to have uh, uh, to raise a how do you raise a country's savings rate, and how do you raise a country's quality of education? The quality of education because China doesn't Chinese government doesn't spend more money on education than other developing many other developing countries. So, so it's the families. So in a sense, it's, it's the culture, uh, not just the Chinese culture. If you look at Vietnamese culture, if you look at the Indian culture, so that's the re reason why India has mm -hmm. done well over the past 20 some years after their economic reform mm -hmm. is also because they, India is a culture uh, that emphasizes education as well. So in that sense, so if you don't have that culture, of course, it doesn't mean that you cannot grow, uh, uh, you cannot uh, have a normal mm -hmm. economic growth. So if a country can grow at three or four percent a year, that's a very fast growth. Then you can eventually catch up to the developed economies. But hmm. in order to reach a growth rate of five, six, seven percent a year, so you really have to have high savings rate and a very high level of human capital. And so that's why you you, you so, have to deal with these fundamental factors. So it's hard. As I so the conclusion is that it's very hard for other countries to emu to really emulate Chinese so-called Chinese developed model. There's no model hmm. there. Yeah, but but that begs a second question then around this, and I'm challenged that um, yeah. you're used to this is okay. So if if thriftiness and savings and education are so important, yeah, why no, did no. it only really kick in forty years ago? Why didn't it start earlier? That that's a that's a again a great question. So I try to address that question in the book. Uh, so I didn't have time to get to that in the in the in the in the, in the speech. So so that's a good question. So. So when, when I say this cult, the, uh, the cultural factor is the, in a sense, is the determining uh, factor or the comparative strength of the Chinese uh, economy. Uh, I actually mean that it's, in a sense, it's a differentiate, differentiating factor that distinguishes China from most other developing countries. Mm -hmm. So it's not the only factor that makes a country grow. So to make a country grow fast or to catch up uh, with the uh, high income economies, so a lot of things have to be right. You have to have a uh, you have to have political stability. You cannot be at wars. So the global environment has to be right, and uh, you, of course you have to have good policies. You cannot have well, may not be great policies, but you have to have decent policies. So the government cannot be too corrupt. All these things have to be together, all together. But mm -hmm. then having these things is not. Is, so China, of course, has these conditions. But then there are many other countries that also have met these conditions. So, so what has made China unique or, or special in the past 40 years is the extreme, the, the ex 
extremely high savings rate. Mm -hmm. So only Singapore has higher a higher savings rate, which of course is not surprising because Singaporeans, in a sense, are rich. Most uh, seventy percent of Singaporeans are rich Chinese, and then they have uh, uh, others are uh, Indian and other people. So 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 basically, in Singapore has the highest savings rate in the whole world. So China has the second highest uh, second highest savings rate in the whole world. So so it's so having a cultural savings and ed education is far from sufficient. Because otherwise, China would have done much better earlier. So you need to have the market economy. So market yeah. economy almost is a precondition on economic growth. Yes. Um, a lot of questions coming in around demographics. You know, the the, the world is aging. The baby boomers are now uh, uh, retiring. Uh, you know, when I look specifically at the China's demographic situation, we have a a real challenge uh, like Germany will have an absolute challenge. This fast aging society it will, it will have a big adverse impact uh, on on future on the future of the economy. That would be my hypothesis. What does your research say? In other words, how do we how do we continue the growth, this economic growth miracle that has happened with all the workers and now without the workers? How do we how do we continue that? OK. Great question. So this, I, again, I didn't have time to, to get into the demographic dividend. So the demographic dividend, of course, for academics really actually means the increase in the uh, rate of working population over the total population. So, mm -hmm. so when, the, uh, when, you, when, you, when, uh, uh, when, when your uh, labor force grows faster than your total population, then your de dependency ratio will go down. So of course that well other things being the same. Of course you are going to have faster per capita GDP growth. Mm -hmm. uh, that's called the dem demographic dividend. Then, right. then in my book I actually show that if you compare China with all other countries, China is really not so unique. So other than Africa, other than Africa, if you look at the Latin America, look at the South Asia, look at the other uh, Middle East. So all the other all the other developing countries in those regions have a similar level of demographic dividend in the sense that their dependency ratio has also declined over the past 40 years at about the similar speed as China's. Okay, so in that sense, demographic dividend cannot explain why China has grown faster than those developing economies. So of course, demographic dividend may have contributed about some, according to some demographers, about two to three percent of China's fast economic growth. Mm -hmm. But then because China's growth is like six percentage faster than other countries. So in a sense, still the majority of the miracle has to be explained. And that's not demographic dividend. So if demographic dividend has not contributed a lot to China's fast growth over the past 40 years, then of course, the demographic debt in the future mm -hmm. will not be such a, uh, uh, such a, a, a big drag on the Chinese economy. Of course, I think uh, according to some studies, uh, I look at the data. So, so this uh, China's the, the aging problem in China might contribute about one percentage point of growth in the next, let's say, 20, 30 years in China. Mm -hmm. But then if China can grow five to six percent a year, then yeah. that's not going to be a big deal. But yeah. even for Western European countries, so if you actually look at the growth rate, so the uh, so European countries, of course, are, are, are aging, uh, 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 have been aging, of course, over the past uh, uh, few decades. But still, their per capita GDP growth has slowed only a little bit, mm -hmm. about like 0.5 percentage point. So in that sense, so as long as the economy continues to grow at, let's say, more than 2% or 1% a year, you can cover all the, age, the problem with aging. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Another question that keeps coming up in the in the recent uh, weeks and months, you know, the energy thing is seems to be subsided, but the debt, the the issue with debt and real estate seems to be, you know, people are asking a little bit along those lines. Uh, you know, Evergrande. There are many other uh, other topics out there, other firms that are being challenged. I, I'm going to ask a very tough question: Is China facing a debt crisis? Well, that's a great question. I just I actually um, I had an interview with CNBC just uh, a couple of weeks ago. They basically raised the same question. So actually, in my book, I had a I had a chapter on this issue. So as a, 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 about the recent slowdown in the Chinese economy. So 
So the, of course, this a lot of people, uh, both in China and outside of China, uh, are worried about China's high so-called leverage or debt debt level. So mm -hmm. so so the, the the concern is that China has one of the highest uh, debt to GDP ratio. This debt, not not public debt, is is highest corporate debt to GDP ratio. Uh, about 170 percent, or it has increased over the past few years uh, to maybe 170 percent, uh, 170 percent. So, so that's 1.7 for debt and the one for for GDP. And uh, the similar ratio for like uh, the U.S. is less than one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then, then then people say, okay, China's Chinese economy is highly leveraged. And so, so when you are highly leveraged, then if the economy slows down, and then of course, then 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 bad debt will occur. And companies will go go get go to um, uh, will become will, will go bankrupt, and uh, the, and the bad debt will lead to financial crisis, which leads to economic crisis, and then the whole bubble of Chinese growth will, in a sense, burst. But that's actually is again it's it's a misunderstanding. Uh, basically, uh, so so that's why this high save this 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 uh, high this savings uh, issue arises. Because China, it, it is actually quite normal for China to have a high corporate debt to GDP ratio. So because China has such a high savings rate. So, so, so when you have high savings, then of course, uh, high savings means the, the total amount of savings to GDP, savings to GDP ratio is high. And then of course, savings means bank deposits. So the bank deposits to GDP ratio will be high and deposits of course will be uh, transforming to debt. Because deposits have to be lend out, so debt to GDP ratio will also be high. So in a sense, so the China's debt to GDP ratio being high is very normal in a sense, given that country has a very high savings rate. Mm -hmm. So, so the the, the 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 real measure of leverage is actually is the common debt to asset ratio, not debt to GDP ratio. The reason why people use corporate debt to GDP ratio is because people don't know how. The total amount of assets in a country. So we know GDP, but we don't know the total amount of assets in a country. So we just use a simple uh, denominator of GDP, which actually is very misleading. Sure. So, in fact, when China started to leverage in 2016, China actually that the corporate sector of China reached the lowest debt to asset ratio. So in a sense, China's lever corporate leverage ratio is on the lowest level historically. So, so in that sense, so there is a misreading of China's debt problem. Of course, in certain sectors like the real estate sector, some real estate developers are highly leveraged. Their debt to asset ratio, again, is also very high. So that can be a problem, but at the macro level, at macro mm -hmm. level, so the high debt to GDP ratio uh, in China is not an issue. Yeah, it's not an issue. I'd like to end the today's session with a, maybe a very mean question, but what's the one question you didn't want me to ask you today? <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't think about that question. Yeah, that's okay. I, I don't know which, yeah. which one. So yeah, you you ask yeah. whatever question that you might have. Well, yeah. But, but what, one of the questions that comes up right now that I'm seeing is this idea, one of the hot topics is, uh, let's see if I can phrase this right, about common prosperity. Uh -huh. And it seems to be, it says it seems to be their big step back from reforms. Um, yet I see strong parallels between the Western ideas of stakeholder capitalism, economics of mutuality from Oxford. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's a, uh, so uh, from my reading, I don't think uh, this common prosperity is something so new. I think it's, it goes way back to I, I mean, common Deng Xiaoping <laughs> used this term common prosperity, but yeah. Deng Xiaoping said let some people get rich first. Because China was so poor, so to have common so so uh, when when people, uh, forty years ago China Ch Chinese people were equally poor, so that's common poverty. So common to poverty. reach common prosperity, you have to let some people get rich first, and then afterwards, then people everybody get um, uh, richer. So, uh, so uh, if you can go back to 2005, so when when uh, uh, Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao were the leaders mm -hmm. of the country, so they had this 
developed, they, they, they initiated this concept of harmonious society. So the whole point was to have a, 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 a more equal income uh, distribution. And to also, of course, this first they started at reducing absolute poverty. And then, then of course, then they, they also started to build up the social welfare system. So under uh, those, that system were, was built up under who and the when. So basically, so they already, in a sense, practiced this, uh, this common prosperity. But of course, last year, China declared that China had basically eliminated absolute poverty. Now, China, of course, from now on, China would have to, to deal with so-called relative poverty. So, of course, that means prosperity. But then the, 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 the national leaders have said very explicitly that common prosperity doesn't mean equality of income for all. Right. It doesn't mean that you... So, basically, so, so that means that, that the goal, of course, is to, to make the income distribution more equal. And uh, because China, indeed, uh, has one of the least equal incomes in the whole world. Mm -hmm. So of course, it's, to me, it's quite natural to go towards that direction. So I hope there's no change of hearts in economic reform, in marketization, uh, but I guess that's not the case. I think uh, that, that it's just, uh, I think it's more of a continuation of the past policy than a, a new direction of, 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 the, of the reform, yeah. Professor, thank you so much for your time, for your in interest in sharing this, uh, mm -hmm. for the insights about the growth of the economy and the, and the future growth. We thank you very, very much for your time. Dear okay, audience you. and participants, thank you also for taking time out of your busy schedule. Thanks for the questions. We'll try and get back with some of those to you. We hope that this was an enlightening first uh, inaugural experience that expands, expanded your horizons. And we look very forward to see you at our next webinar. Thank you all so much for attending. <laughs>